Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life of a sand grain, an unauthorized biography. So um, the way that we're going to approach this is from the standpoint of a paparazzi. So when you see my students and myself out in the field, we're often hiding in bushes, we're laying on the ground, we're sneaking around, we're trying to catch what a grain of sand is doing in its natural habitat without us disturbing it or causing any problems, the last thing we want to do is get into a fight with a sand grain out in the middle of a beach. So we often have people laying on the ground looking at sand grains, trying to figure out exactly what they're, what they're looking at, what kind of stories they can tell, because each one of these grains of sand has a story. And then when we pile them together, we can get a really great story out of, out of what's going on and tell the, the history of a spot on the surface of the earth. So what can a single grain of sand tell us? Now, Whenever we see grains of sand, we often take a look at them and we have wonderful colors. Clear grains, red grains, black grains, translucent green grains, orange, brown, blue, black, and all these different colors mean something. Each one of those colors relates to composition, to the minerals of them. So the, the sand that's up on the upper left-hand corner is quartz sand. It's a very mature sand. It's from Australia. Um, the reason we call it mature is that it's well-rounded. Almost everything else has weathered out of it. So it tells us that it's been around a long time. It's been traveling a lot. This is black basalt sand, and the green translucent ones are uh, olivine crystals. And this is from a beach in the Azores. This is a very, very young sand, and it's actually inside holes of a uh, ship boring worm on a uh, board that I found on the beach in uh, on uh, Pico Island about two weeks ago. The bottom one with the quarter is uh, sand from Hammond and Asset Beach in Connecticut. And it's also a very, it's an immature glacial sand. It has lots of different stuff in it. And these are big sand grains. This is considered coarse grain. Um, this is fine grain at the top. This is medium. And this is a mixture. And all of them are about the same scale, just to give you an idea of, of where we stand. Um, but the, the size also tells us a lot about this. Then I'll come back to the size in a second. And then this is from the Boston Harbor Islands. And if you notice, it's a mix of, of shell hash and little bits of broken, broken shells. And it tells a completely different story. When we start to think about sand, we start to look at how sand moves. And if at any point in time you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I won't get upset. So when we think about how sand moves, we can start to think about what causes that motion and what the different processes are and how those processes leave an imprint in the clusters of sand that we see on the surface of the earth. So we have windblown sand creating sand dunes and ripples and actually filling in a walkway on the Azores. We have sand that, is flow that has flowed under the force of gravity um, on Rainbow Beach in Australia, a white sand and a, and a tan sand over an orange bluff on top of a buff-colored beach sand. We have washover sands on Lovells Island that are created by large storm waves that carry sand from the beach back in on top of the wetland. And then we have large ocean waves that are actually moving very large pieces of material. They're moving blocks that are the size of cars. All of these different methods of moving sand leave some sort of an imprint in the sand itself as you start to see the sand pile up. So as we continue to look at how sand moves and what moves sand, we can start to look at, further look at wind. So we have uh, a series of dust devils rolling down between two little hills, picking up sand and carrying sand down and depositing it somewhere else. We have the ocean stripping off sand from a beach, carrying that sand offshore to store it only to return back onshore at some other time in the future. We have tufts of grass that are blocking the wind that are allowing sand to accumulate behind it. So it's not only the, the process of wind or water that's moving the sand, but it's also the objects that the, the flow encounters to create lower velocity areas to catch the wind or catch the sand grains as that velocity slows down. Picture down here on the bottom right, this is sand ripples that are also deposited by wind. And this is from out in Colorado. 
where we just have these nice low bed forms, nice low ripples that are created by a persistent wind that blows from the same direction. So when we start to look at these individual sand grains and start to think about how they move and what causes them to move, we start to look at the velocity of the fluid. The, the diagram up in the upper left is the Hulstrom diagram, and this is specifically keyed toward water flows. Across the bottom is the size of particle, clay, silt, sand, gravel, pebble, boulders. All of those have specific geologic definitions. Sand, which, we, which is what we're interested in, is in a size range from 63 microns to 2 millimeters. Up the vertical axis is the velocity of flow. So one of the things that we can look at with sand is that it has this really nice relationship to velocity. That as the velocity increases, you can pick up bigger particles and bigger particles and bigger particles. And then once you get them picked up, you can actually start to entrain them in the fluid and move them at, with just a little bit more velocity. So if we start to look at medium sand, which is one millimeter, it'll start to move at a velocity of 10 centimeters per second, and it will be completely entrained in the fluid at 30 centimeters per second. Now, this may seem kind of um, really straightforward and simple, but it's actually very important because as we increase the velocity, we start to pick up bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger materials. Once we slow that velocity da down, what's the first thing that falls out? The biggest particles. That leads to this. This is what we refer to as graded bedding. And this is two separate events where you have a high velocity flow event that picks up all the sediment and then as the velocity starts to slow down you drop the big particles and then the finer particles and then the finest particles and then you're in a state of really fine sediment deposition or possibly no sediment deposition and then the next event comes by. This is what we call graded bedding. This represents primarily flood deposits. So anytime you have a major flood, this is what you'll see in the geologic record. Now, I mentioned the maturity of sand. So sand, as it's tossed around, and actually pebbles and gravel, as they're tossed around, they start out very angular, very irregularly shaped. And as they're tossed in the water, rolled around, impacting other grains, they'll move toward a state of roundness. So all those nice little pebbles that you find at the nature store, um, they've all been tumbled. And what they do is they put them in a drum with a, with a grit, and they just tumble it and tumble it and tumble it in water until you knock all the round edges off of it. And you put in a finer grit, and you get something that gets even rounder and gets even smoother. And you continue to do that until you round all the edges off of it. This happens naturally in any system. So we can look at the, the angularity or the roundness of the grains to determine how long it's been transported, how old that grain is, how mature it is. We can also take a look at when you start to knock the corners off, you knock the corners off with high velocity impacts and very um, intense meetings of two sand grains. That, all, that almost always and exclusively happens in flow by water. Once you start to get down here to rounding, what you really end up having for rounded grains is a lot of wind transport because the wind can't pick the grains up high enough with enough velocity to actually make them impact each other with the force needed to chip them. So they end up skipping off of each other and brushing each other and they end up with a frosted or a scratched surface. So we can look at the surface of the sand grain and tell a lot about how it is actually transported. And then we can start to look at what happens when we bring all these different grains of sand together. If it's well sorted, if all the grains are all the same size or roughly the same size, it means we have a very uniform process. If the grains are very different size, it means something totally different. We have something that's going on that's a little more random or a little bit scattered, or you have a deposit that's been disturbed. Now, when we start to pull these different things together, we can start to see this actually in the outcrop or on the beach or someplace else.
The picture on the left is a series of volcanoclastic flows. So this is sediment that was erupted out of a volcano, flowed across the land, and as the velocity slowed down, as the flow waned, we deposited the large particles and then the fine particles, and then we had another event that happened after we had this period of slowing down. So we have one event where we have fine material. You don't see the coarse stuff because it's buried below the beach. We have a horizon that's not very uniform. Coarse material, fine material, the finest stuff, another undulating horizon, and then coarse material at the top. We have three different events, three finding upward sequences. And within each of these, on this horizon, we actually don't know what exactly happened. What we do know is we have the boundary of one event and a subsequent event that happened later. We don't know, though, what happened at the exact time that this event occurred. The undulating surface suggests that this event, the velocity that deposited these large grains, at first stripped off material from the event below it. So there's a little bit of a missing record there. How much is missing? We don't know. Could it be an entire sequence of an event, a single event like this? All, could all of this be missing? Yeah. Could just a little bit of it be missing? Possibly. But we don't know that at this point. That's one of the things that we have to try to figure out. So when we look at trying to read the language and trying to look at what's recorded in change, this is just like a book. This tells us the story of what happened in this location. However, like an old dusty book that you pull out of the library, somebody went through and ripped out a couple of pages. And it's our job as geologists to figure out what happened at this spot where the pages are missing. So we make up stories to fill in that gap. And then we test those stories by looking at other locations, by trying to come up with something that is a reasonable explanation. So these finding upward sequences are great examples of, of events that record high velocity flows, floods, volcanoes, all sorts of different things. The upper, the upper right, this is something similar but, but different. We have these beds that dip at an angle like this. So these were deposited by something that probably not the same process that deposited our big flood beds. This is actually characteristic of, of dunes, of sand dunes. And then up on the top, we have boulders, large, large pieces of, of gravel in through here, another high flow event. And we can tell on this that there's been significant material removed because these stop right on that horizon. And, not, and normally you would expect those to actually roll over like this. So we have a good portion of the record missing. We don't know exactly how much, but we do know we have missing record. Something else that's recorded with our sands as they age and as they go through time. This is a single piece of sandstone actually collected down the beach from this. And the colors on it show changes in oxidation and reduction environments as the water table fluctuated over this, this rock when it was in place. We have this intense orange color. And in fact, it actually almost goes to black in a couple of places. And then this white sand down below. What do we know that makes things orange? Say that again? Iron. What specifically about iron? What's that? Iron oxide, oxide, rust. So we're actually seeing a change from a reducing environment to an oxidizing environment. Area that had a lot of water, area that was exposed to air. And this is a boundary of where the groundwater table fluxed back and forth over a period of time. So we know a little bit about what was going on, even in the subsurface, from, from these. Now, when we get our sand grains together in groups, they can tell us even more about the story. 
this little semicircle U-shaped feature that's about 10 feet across is an old river channel that's carved into a deposit of volcanic material. We can see once again those, the finding upward sequence. We can see a large truncation event, but this time it's actually something that's come in from the side. So this river channel was actually migrating this way before it stopped and got filled in. Tells us a little bit about what was going on. The river, the river abandoned that channel in favor of something else, and it allowed it to get filled in. We have our nice flat-lying sands that tells us we have a very uniform process that's going on. All of these are about the same grain size, so we know that the, the flow velocity is about the same. This is a pit in a sand dune that shows us those dipping, those dipping beds, the lines that go this way that I pointed out on the, uh, the slide before. This is an active sand dune, so we know exactly what's going on on this. And that's one of the keys that we use. One of, the, one of our golden rules in geology is the principle of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. Anything that we see happening now, we should expect to see the same process happen in the past. The rates may have been different slightly, but there's no reason to, to think that that process that's going on today would have operated any different in the past. So as sand blows across the dune, it's going to pick up a little bit of sand and deposit it. That should happen today, as happened five years ago, 5,000 years ago, 5 million years ago, 4.5 billion. This is a series of these channels that are cut into, into a sandstone and then preserved. So we have you can see one nice channel cutting into a channel that's down below it, another channel here, a channel that's cut into the previous channel on the top. So we have all these channels stacked on top of each other. And this tells us something very specific about the type of environment that was there when the sand was deposited. This is indicative of something called a meandering stream. It's very different than, than this. This is the, excuse me, this is the meandering stream. This is a braided stream. So this is one channel that kind of wanders back and forth. This is a whole series of channels that cross, cross cut each other. These are often in areas that are arid, that have a lot of water, that have a lot of sediment, and they have a lot of coarse sediment. You find them at the bases of glaciers. You can find them on beaches. You can find them in deserts. The meandering channels are often cut into finer grain material because their banks are a little stable and they hold together and they constrain the water flow. So once again, the, the grains that are here and the grains that are here tell us a lot about the environment when those pieces of sediment were dropped. Braided channel, meandering channel, flat-lying beach sediments, and dipping sand dunes. So we can start to look at these accumulations of sand and start to back out what exactly happened here in the past. Now, now that we know a little bit about what each sand grain is telling us, and a little bit about what happens when these sand grains unite into a mob, we can start to figure out a little bit about what's going on. We have four different images that show four very different things. We'll start with the simplest one first. Nice flat-lying layers. We have fine grain material. We have coarser grain material, fine grain material, coarser grain material. And what do we have? Ah, we have floods. But that's not exactly what's going on because we don't exactly know what the grains of sand are. Now, this just so happens to be the exact opposite because these little pieces that are about the size of a dime or so are actually pumice. So they're actually lighter than anything else and they float on water. So this is actually an inverse sequence. This is a reverse grading. 
This is one of those places where you really have to closely listen to what the grain is telling you. And it might not be obvious from the picture, but if you are there and you look at it, you can start to look at the grains of, the grains of sand, the pumice floating in the water. The, this is pumice that's on a beach in Australia. And it came from an undersea eruption out off the coast of Vanuatu and was carried and floated on the ocean and brought into the beach and incorporated in the layers on the beach. And it is a really bizarre thing to see, to see this upside down than what you would normally expect. And it is the first thing that everybody thinks of is, oh, we have a flood event. And it's the course at the bottom and the fine at the top. But because of the types of sediment we have, it's the exact opposite of what we would normally expect. Really, really coarse sand grains with these, this horizon at the bottom, dipping beds, horizon at the top. This is a little package of ripples moving in a river. So this is a blow up really close up of what we would have seen in that river channel that was orange that was down here on the previous slide. Flat-lying dune sands that look flat-lying from this side, but as you look back into the cut, you can see that they actually show the angle of avalanching faces as that sand blows up over the dune and falls down the side, telling us the story of how that, how that face evolved. And also, the orientation of these beds, as these beds and these down here, too, that have an angular component to them, show us the direction of flow. They tell us which way the water was flowing, which way the wind was blowing. So we can start to extract that and start to put together which way the river went, where it was eroding sediment, where it was transporting it past, and where it was coming to at the final end. So we can ask these grains of sand exactly to tell us their story in their own words. So we go out and we dig pits and we take measurements in pits to measure the angle of the beds to try to figure out which way the sand was blowing. We look at the changes in grain size to try to figure out the velocity since we know the smaller grains are carried by less vigorous flows and the coarser grains are carried by more vigorous flows. And we go out and we stand in lakes and take cores to try to look at the changes in the sediment below to try to figure out the history of what was going on in the water of this lake. So was it a quiet water settling with really fine-grained muds? Did it dry out? Was there a component of wind-blown sand that came in? That's what the cores from this area will tell us. So we can actually interrogate, 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 <clears throat> talk to these grains of sand. <laughs> Talk to these grains of sand and ask them directly what their story is and get first-hand knowledge from them. We can also ask them how old they are. So when we look at sands, we can do one of two things. We can actually date the grains of sand directly using a technique called optical stimulated luminescence dating. Three big words, we abbreviate it as OSL, and it basically means that as you expose grains of quartz sand too light and they get bleached and they pick up an energy signature. When you bury them and you lock them off from that light source, they decay. The light and energy decays out of them and that's a known rate. It happens at a constant rate. The old uh, diving watches that have the, the luminescent markers on them, you hit them with light and then you go to bed and you wake up at one o'clock in the morning and it's still glowing. At two o'clock it's a little it's a little dimmer at 3 o'clock, it's even dimmer than that, and by 6 a.m. there's no glowing left on your watch. It's the same principle that we use to actually date the sand grains. And we can date sand grains back several million years using this process. The other thing that we can do is we can indirectly date our sand grains by finding something that the sand grains have buried, and in this case, there's a log. We can take a sample of that log, submit it for radiocarbon dating, and figure out the age of the log, and then we know, basically, that the sand that's on top of the log is younger than the log, and the sand below the log is older than the log. 
one of these rules of geology that we have that's called the rule of superpositioning. It basically means that young's on top, old's on the bottom. Try it with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Try to put the bottom piece of bread in last. Um, it doesn't work very well. It's the same thing when you're dealing with deposition sediments. And radiocarbon is something that we're all absorbing at a known rate today. It's a radioactive element. It's generated up in the atmosphere by cosmic radiation interacting with nitrogen. And as we absorb that into our system, once we die, or once our log dies, we are no longer able to absorb that into our system anymore because we're not breathing, we're not eating plants, we're not doing any of those things where we would absorb carbon. So that decays at a known rate, and we can date things back to about 60,000 years, provided they have an organic content. So we can figure out how old things are. And we can also do the hearsay thing of he said, she said, and try to figure out what exactly is going on below the surface without actually talking to the sand grains themselves. And we do this using geophysics. This is a, an EM sensor. It uses electromagnetic, um, basically sends electricity into the ground, and that electricity is either absorbed or transmitted based on the, the material that's, that's below. Quartz sand is very resistive to electricity flow, so we get less energy back. Clay is really conductive, so we get a lot of energy back. Based on that, we can start to tell what's going on the subsurface. This is my tool of choice. This is a ground penetrating radar. It sends radar waves down, and those radar waves bounce off of things that have a different density or different or, um, orientation. And we can start to see a picture that emerges where we have angled beds, flat-lying beds, slightly angled beds, and we can relate these to what we saw in our outcrops. These are actually our beaches. This is sand dunes on the top, and this is another beach sequence down below. Now, one of the interesting things about this is this is a non-unique solution, so it doesn't tell us exactly what the answer is. It's kind of like that old game of telephone where I can start on this side of the room and whisper a message and we can pass it all the way back through everybody and get to the back corner over here and the two things probably aren't the same. So we need some way to actually link those together and that's where our direct observations come in of actually asking the sand grain themselves. It's just like what they do in CSI when they sit in the interrogation room of trying to figure out what's going on and determining the real story of what happened. It's the same thing we do out in the field working with grains of sand. Now, once we know what an individual grain of sand can tell us, once we know how to figure out what this cluster of sand grains that creates different structures can tell us, once we've talked to the sand grains, once we've talked to the sand grains' friends and got the hearsay information, we can start to put all this together and figure out what happened in a specific location. This is the North Island of New Zealand. It's an area called uh, Ruakaka. And this is data that I collected in January where we were looking for large trees that are buried in a peat deposit. So we have a, a swamp. And below that swamp, we have things that have this characteristic dipping beds like we saw in what the holes that we dug in the sand dunes. So we've interpreted that as aeolian deposits or stuff that was blown in by the wind. We start to see these really bright things that are kind of like lazy S's. These are deposited by flowing water and in this case we figured out that it's a beach. So we actually have a beach that turned into sand dunes and then the sand dunes were abandoned and we had the area fill in in between the sand dunes with organic material that build up over several thousands, tens of thousands of years and actually completely buried the landscape. So by knowing a little bit about what these sand grains can tell us, we can actually come up with an entire story of what happened at this place. Beach, sand dunes, wetlands. So in order for that to happen, we had to have falling sea level, to have the beach migrate away and leave these uh, 
former beach positions in place. We then had to have bare sand with wind to be able to build the sand dunes. We then had to have the sand dunes stabilize and the area get much wetter in order to have the intense vegetation come in to develop the, the wetland deposits. So we needed a lot of water and a lot of vegetation to create several meters of, of peat. So we have an idea of what's going on. We're actually in the process of dating this. We have a volcanic ash layer that's 47,000 years old. Um, we have trees that have been extracted, that have been dated um, on this horizon, on this boundary between the sand and the peat in another location, that have been dated to 138,000 years old. So we're looking at a beach that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 140,000 years old. So this would have been back at the time we were coming out of the last glaciation before this glaciation. So we've got a really interesting record here that we're working on trying to establish what exactly was going on. So the final chapter. So we've talked to the sand grains. We've talked to their friends. We've sampled them. We've interrogated them. We've gone through all sorts of different things. Now we can start to put together stories in all sorts of different places based on what we know about how sand grains behave as individuals and how they behave when they're together in a pack, their mob mentality. So sand dunes, great sand dune national park in Colorado. This is an area that is only uh, about 20,000 years old. It has sand dunes that are about uh, 200 feet tall. Uh, and those sit right at the base of the Rocky Mountains and the sand was derived from an old lake that dried up that's in the, the valley off to the what would be your left. The orange and tan and white and brown sands are from Rainbow Beach in Australia and you can see why they call it Rainbow Beach. This represents over a million years worth of sand dunes in this one spot. It is the world's largest downdrift sand environment it is the home to the world's largest sand island. The sand dunes in this location that are over a million years old are in excess of 250 meters tall. So to put that in perspective, if you were to pile this sand dune up against the Prudential, only the top eight feet of the building would stick out. Big, big pile of sand. And based on what we're finding from this, we're, we're looking at these to try to establish paleo wind patterns. So what was the changes in the winds during times of cold versus times of warm, times of dry, times of wet. So we can extract all that information from those sand dunes. This is one of our finding upward sequences with volcanic ash, showing times of volcanic inactivity versus times of volcanic activity. The, the dark layer that's right here is a very thick volcanic ash layer. Uh, it's about four inches thick. And there's another one down, down at the base. So we can figure out how long we have between volcanic eruptions, provided the wind was blowing in the right direction, which is something else that we can figure out by sampling all around the volcanic crater. And this is a nice gravel beach that's on uh, the island of Pico in the Azores. Um, not exactly sand, but gravel tells us a lot of the same thing. It's just sand's bigger brother. Um, and while it looks like it's a very nice, calm environment, you see a lot of the same things that I showed you from Lovell's Island. These large gravel washovers showing intense waves carrying material from here onto the back side of it. The only difference to this is the average size of the boulders on this beach are about the size of your head. It's not some place that you'd want to be when there are big waves. So. Now we've come to the end. Now, as this is a story of a paparazzi approach to the life and times of a sand grain, where they're not exactly knowing that they're being recorded and they don't want you to tell their story, but we're gonna tell it anyway, I would encourage you that as you leave here today and you go out into the big wide world, that you stop and pause and think about the stories that the, billion, the billions and billions of grains of sand that you walk over every day have a story to tell and they're screaming at you to tell their story. You just have to know how to listen to them and speak their language. Thank you. <laughs>
So one of the things about the about Rainbow Beach with the different colors of sand is they don't only they don't really represent different compositions of the sand. They represent different materials that have been leached down through the groundwater. So instead of taking a a pile of, of sand like you have sand art and putting in red sand and brown sand and blue sand and green sand to come up with this layered pretty looking thing that you might make at a county fair, we actually have one body of sand that is almost pure quartz sand that as, the, as you have soil develop on the top, that's, that organic material is leached and migrates down through and carries iron and magnesium and calcium and all sorts of other different things that go down and as it hits the water table they tend to, to precipitate out. And you saw the, the one rock that we showed that I showed with the white versus the really bright orange. So that happens at these oxidation reduction zones. And once you get some of those formed, it's tough to actually strip them out. So that's actually a process that happens secondarily to depositing the sands themselves. They don't actually come out that color. They actually get colored uh, through time as water percolates down through the, the deposit. Um, we think so. There is, just like talking about the processes that operate now, should have operated the same five years, 5,000, 5 million, 500 million years, four billion years ago, should be the same. There isn't any reason that we, sh we would believe that things should operate any differently on Mars. However, Mars has a different gravity has a di different composition of its atmosphere. So we have different fluid to deal with. We have different gravitational forces to deal with. So we actually have to tease out those individual differences to be able to redevelop our, our models of what it takes to move a sand grain because we're not dealing with the same force of gravity. We're not dealing with the same density of atmosphere. So we have a, a few things to, to work out. So I would say they're speaking the same language, but it's a very different dialect. So when we start thinking about where all this sand comes from, um, I'm not an expert on the Sahara in Africa, but I will relate this to what's going on in Australia. Um, so Fraser Island, the world's largest sand island with these sand dunes that are 250 meters tall, has a beach on it that's called 75 Mile Beach, called 75 Mile Beach because it's 75 miles from one end to the other, uh, and that only makes up two thirds of the island. That is the end of this large downdrift sand system. The picture that I showed you in the beginning of the large waves crashing up against the cliff that had the fishing rods in it, that's outside of Sydney, just uh, south of Bondi Beach. That cliff that is eroding is actually supplying all of the sand for the development of Fraser Island. The process of erosion, of knocking apart big rocks into small rocks into little rocks in the grains of sand is constantly going on and we're generating an immense amount of sand just through our everyday average processes that work on on the surface of the earth not to mention we have a lot of sand that's stored in rivers in coastlines on floodplains that every time you have a high velocity event you mobilize a whole bunch of stuff and you carry it down somewhere and in the case of a lot of these large systems, you carry that sand down, you put it down at one spot with a river, and then the wind picks it up and blows it into a different direction. So the, the input of sand that's coming into to Africa to actually create all the sand that's migrating across Africa to be blown across the Atlantic to be deposited actually on the North American continent and even in the Pacific Ocean is actually coming from the erosion of the continent of Africa itself and be carried, being carried down to the coastlines to be then be moved and spread out throughout the coast and then be blown into the, into the desert. So with the example that, we're, that I'm working with from the paleo wind direction that Tom brought up in the very beginning of the question series, we can start to look at which direction the winds were blowing, where, where were the storms coming from, 
how often are we seeing these really coarse layers which represent high intensity events? Are we seeing more frequent high intensity events? Are we seeing less frequent intensity events? In the terms of the washover fans from Lovells Island, those are developed during very strong storms. We're actually using those, finding those in salt marshes, and a scientist down in Woods Hole named Jeff Donnelly has actually perfected the technique of looking at those coarse deposits in salt marshes to, to figure out when hurricanes have passed. And it's a field that is called paleotempestology. So uh, geologists have a tendency to make up words and stick things together to, to represent what it is that we do. So paleo, old, tempest, storm, ology, study of. Um, but it's basically looking at the patterns that we have and how those patterns have changed. And then we have to take those changes in those patterns and figure out why those changes have happened. Can we relate it to a long-term migration of a frontal boundary? Can we relate it to an increase in activity of, say, El Nino? Can we relate it to changes in sea level? Can we relate it to changes in precipitation by having a more active or less active river system? So it's actually the first thing we have to do is identify a change and then once we identify the change, we have to figure out why that change happened. Let's see now. And What's that? Chow time. That's what that is. That is a very, very big lion's mane jelly, and they are absolutely delicious, apparently. <laughs> so I'm told. <laughs> So as you can see now, um, leatherbacks are not the cleanest eaters. This kind of <laughs> reminds me of my almost two-year-old, in fact.